all I can say that uh, whatever I did, uh, probably if I can look back, I can say I was uh, trying to do very little things. And I was not trying to persuade anybody to do anything, just uh, what I thought I can do, I tried to do that. Uh, and it started with a little amount of money. So little that um, you can laugh at it uh, looking back. Uh, it's a total loan of $27 to 42 people. So it's uh, not even a dollar a piece. So that's uh, what uh, excited me and wanted to do more of it. Uh, trying to persuade the banks to do it, they wouldn't do it. So I offered myself as a guarantor. I said, okay, I'll sign all your papers and take all the risk and you give the money. They were stuck with their rules and procedures, so I was trying to kind of get over those things. And that was the beginning. Luckily, it worked and continued to grow, lending money to poor women, tiny little money. Everybody said it's going to collapse very soon. He said, until it collapses, I'll keep on doing it. So why should I stop it just because someday it is going to collapse, which we don't know whether it will. Uh, that's it, and then we created a bank out of it, called it Grameen Bank or Village Bank. And people ask me, how did you figure this out? All these rules and procedures that you put into it so that it can work even in very adverse circumstances, still it works. I said, oh, I don't do very hard work, I'm an easygoing man. Uh, I just look at the conventional banks, how they do it. And once I learned how they do it, each piece, and I just do the opposite. <laughs> and it works. They go to the rich people, so I decided to go to the poor people. They go to men, so I decided to go to women. They go to the city center to business, I wanted to go to the village, remote village. They want collateral, I said, forget about collateral. Who wants collateral? If you want collateral, you never get to the poor people. So dismiss collateral. They have big lawyers in their bank. We said, we don't need lawyers. So we are the only lawyer-free bank in the whole world, probably. It works, we don't need them. <laughs> And lawyers and the banks, conventional banks, want to know your all antecedents, what you have been doing, whether you know everything, what kind of business you have been running, everything, your past, as much details as they can get. So we said, forget about it. We are not interested in the past of our borrowers. We are interested in the future of our borrowers. So if you are looking for the poor people, I'm sure there is something they have done which you know, may not be very pleasant, why you dig into it? So b because he or she is not responsible for his society is responsible for what he or she has been doing. So why don't you just give it a break and start fresh? Uh, see what he or she wants. And this is how we wanted to do. Conventional banks uh, concentrated uh, on owning uh, or conventional banks are owned by the borrow, uh, rich people. So we reversed that too. We made this bank owned by the poor people. And not only conventional banks are owned by rich people, mostly it's owned by rich men. So we reversed that. We not only make it owned by the poor people, we made it owned by poor women. So this is a bank which is owned by the borrowers themselves. Right now we have 8.3 million borrowers. 97% of them are women, and they own the bank. They run the bank. They are the board. They decide the rules and procedures and so on and so forth. So this is one way to describe how the f operationally and structurally the whole bank is done. And then you can understand where we come from. It's not just tiny size of loan makes it come in bank. It's a kind of making everything other way. In one meeting in the early years, 10th year or 11th year, of bankers. The one banker was saying, Professor Yunus, you're not going to get, it, get away with this. You made the whole banking system upside down. I said, yes, I, that's what exactly I did, because banking system was standing on its head. So I'm trying to put it on its head. <laughs> yeah. 
And they challenged me on an account. They said, you should change the name of your bank. Make the name Grameen Women's Bank. Several bankers suggested that I should change the name of the bank because explanation was that at that time we are only 64% women. The rest of us men in the early years. So when I was replying to this question, I said, yes, I'm very happy to change the name of the bank. I'll make the bank Grameen Women's Bank. But, but before I do that, you would like to, you'd have to do something. Change the name of your bank. Because 99% of your borrowers are men. So you should say X men's bank, Y men's bank, Z men's bank. After you have done this, then I will come and do mine. Come in women's bank. So it's very easy. When you do it with women, everybody says it's wrong. You shouldn't. If you do it with men, that's perfect. There's no problem with that. So this is continuously we have been facing. And another issue comes up in our work because I've been insisting that all human beings are entrepreneurs. It burns up many people. Oh, why does he say that? There are only few people who are entrepreneurs. The rest of us, we are not entrepreneurs. We have to work under the entrepreneurs. I said, no, all human beings are entrepreneurs. That's how we survived on this planet. Otherwise, we would be in the caves, still living the kind of life we live there, because we all work together to change our life. That's how we came here and we still function here. They didn't take it very seriously. Then they said, yes, you can lend money to the poor people, but you should be looking for entrepreneurial poor. I said, not in my case, because everybody's entrepreneur, so I go ahead with that. Even she tells me again and again, no, sorry, please don't give me money. I don't know what to do with my, your money. I never use money in my life. I can't use your money. We don't give up. We keep on chasing. We keep on explaining to her, no, you can do that. So that confidence builds up in her. Just because she doesn't have confidence doesn't mean that she doesn't, have, she doesn't have entrepreneurial ability. It's a question of building confidence in her. So we try to build the confidence because society has totally demolished her confidence in herself. That's what the poor people are. You're saying you are wrong, you are no good, you are good for nothing. And generation after generation, they, they have heard it, they have, that's what they believe in. So we wanted to change that, build confidence in them. So in order to demonstrate that even the poorest person can be an entrepreneur, one idea came to me, so why don't I do something so that I can demonstrate this? This idea was to lend money to beggars. You cannot be poorer than beggars. That's the last stage of human survival. You have no other source, you go and beg for your daily food. Go to houses, neighbors, find something to eat, or get some money to eat, and that's how you survive. You not only do it once or twice, that becomes your livelihood for the rest of your life. I said, let's try that. So we started talking to the beggars. We started talking that as you go from house to house begging, would you like to carry some merchandise with you? Some cookies, some candies, some toys for the kids, and we make it sound easy for them by saying, you are going there anyway. This is not extra work for you. So, and you are giving people more options, so that if they don't give, want to give anything free, you may try to sell something. So they may like to buy something, or they may like to do both, give you some food free, and also buy something from you. So you have two businesses going, instead of one business. People like that, beggars like that. They said, where do we get the money? I said, we'll give you the money. So we started giving them the loan. Our idea was, if they succeeded in getting the loan and paying us back by the business they would do, that will show that, yes, even a beggar can be an entrepreneur on his own, on our own. We thought there'll be 1,000 or 2,000 beggars in that program. It became such a popular program. We ended up with more than 100,000 beggars in that program. And we have been watching them, what is there, what are they doing? It's become very popular, what they do, as we explained. And now, in the last five years, this is about the time that we are doing it. In the last five years, out of this 100,000 beggars, 
more than 22,000 beggars have stopped begging completely because they became successful door-to-door -door salesperson. And not only they became door-to-door -door salesperson, some of them became your personal shoppers. You come and the housewife says, when you come tomorrow, you bring me this. She brings you this because she cannot go to the market all the time, but this, this lady is going around doing things, so she brings you whatever you needed, little things, but you have a good business going. People ask us to buy them, and she, she feels comfortable, and the family feels comfortable with it. My colleagues who are getting so enthusiastic about this program, because they felt, see that even a beggar can change her life by selling something, doing something, they keep saying, why don't the other beggars get out of begging? Why are they taking so much time? I try to, I try to advise them to be patient. I said, please be patient. It takes time. After all, begging is their core business. You don't shut down your core business just like that. <laughs> you have to be totally confident how the new business, your sales division, is working. So, so once they figure out what the sales division is doing well, then they may say, well, this division, core, core business, we can now shift. So it takes a lot of courage to come to that stage that you close down completely. So this is gradually, they will come. When you talk to them, they tell you something very interesting. They say they know which house is good for buying or selling, which house is good for begging. So they go accordingly. So by, by this time, they have experience. Uh, and who are the ones who are doing both? So I tell my colleagues, not only they do the business, we have not trained them anything. They, they already know how to uh, do the market segmentation. Which one? <laughs> and their loan size is such a small amount. They start with something like $12, uh, $15. That's about the size. And paying back that loan, they are enthusiastic to take the second loan and the third loan. Each one becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So you look at this phenomenon and you ask yourself, what creates poverty? What created this situation that human being has to be brought into this kind of situation where they have to beg for existence? Is this the fault of the person? Repeatedly, I come to the same conclusion. There is nothing wrong with the people. Poverty is not created by the poor people. Poverty is created by the system that we have built, the concepts that we have created. That's what created poverty. Nothing, absolutely nothing wrong in human beings. It is, poverty is externally imposed phenomenon. It is not internally developed phenomenon. So if it is externally imposed phenomenon, we can, if we remove that external imposition, people will come up as human being as anybody else. And that's how the question of that bonsai came. I started describing poor people as bonsai people. There's nothing wrong with their seed. They are, they are seed as good as anybody else's seed. Simply, society never gave them the space to grow. So they are just like the tree, tree on a flower pot. So thinking what's going wrong with the concept, I, I started looking at what is happening in the world. I said, in the meantime, in order to solve problems, I started creating businesses. It almost became instinctive in me. Whenever I see a problem, I go right ahead and design a business, I start a business to solve that problem. I didn't notice it before, but when you have done it once, when you've done it twice, and you have done it 100 times, then you realize that you have an instinctive feature that you design a business to solve a problem. You look back, you created so many, pro so many such companies. We have problem of electricity, so we created a solar energy company. Everybody said, oh, solar business is not going to work in Bangladesh. I said, who knows? It may work. Let me give it a try. Nothing wrong. If I fail, it's OK. But I have to try. So I tried to bring solar home system. It is expensive for the plural people. We made it easy for them to pay back. It was extremely difficult even to sell five solar home system 
per month. It was such a struggle. Now we came to a stage after 15 years, we sell more than 1,000 solar home systems per day, and it's growing, improving, and it's done in a business way. So we did the solar energy in a business way, and it's expanding. People love it because they need electricity, because kerosene lemon is no good for them. So this is what we did. Then I realized maybe this is a category of business which is missing in the, in the whole conceptual framework. Because conceptual framework gives you one type of business, business to make money. I said, that's a wrong interpretation of human beings. Human beings are not just money-making machines. Human beings are not robots. Human beings are much bigger than just one-dimensional being. They're multidimensional beings. What happened to other dimensions? So that's when the question of selfish aspect of human being, selfless aspect of human being, came into discussion. I said, why don't we create business on the basis of the selflessness, where I don't want to make money for myself by decision. Nobody has imposed it because I'm so excited to create a business to solve a problem. It is such an, ex ex such an exciting experience to be able to solve a problem. Then I said, that maybe is the one which you should be doing. It's a non-loss, non-dividend company to solve a social problem. So we started creating more and more of these companies. Then we had one connection with the Danone of France. We talked to Frank Ribot. He was trying to understand what Gamin Bank is. I started asking him what uh, Danone is. Then he said, uh, he explained to me what Danone is. Suddenly, I didn't think about it before because I, I, I didn't go with a plan for him. I just stopped on the way to talk to him. I said, what? Why don't she have a uh, company in Bangladesh? We can do it jointly. Whatever he thought, he just w stood up, shook hands with me. He said, yes, let's do that. I said, but I have not finished yet. I said, it would be a social business. He said, what is a social business? Then I gave my spill. This is the social business. You'll never get any money out of it. You can take your money back to what you invested, but nothing more than that. He stood up again, shook hands. He said, I'm, I agree. Then I thought he didn't understand my Bangladeshi English. <laughs> <laughs> and probably I didn't understand his French English. So on the way out, I sent him a very detailed email. And he immediately sent back, I understood everything you said. I stand by what I committed. Let's go ahead and do it. And this is 2005. That company was created in 2007 and continued to function. Now we produce yogurt, fortified with micronutrients for the children who are malnourished in Bangladesh. And that yogurt does wonderful thing to the children because half the children of Bangladesh are malnourished. So this produced a yogurt which has all these micronutrients. And once these children eat this, they regain their health because you see, if you're malnourished, your physical growth becomes very stunted. Similarly, your mental growth becomes stunted. So it's a very strange situation for a nation to have a half the children malnourished. So we thought, at least in our way, we can see if we can do that. Now it works. Since it works as a social business, so we can go and replicate, add as many uh, factories as possible. We have just the first factory, which is fully uh, in full production. So we are starting the second factory. And we calculate we'll have 50 such factories around the country so that every child has access to this yogurt. It's a delicious yogurt. Children love it. So that's an example of social business. So we created many such social business with international collaborations, not because we wanted it, but international, multinational companies wanted it. So we have collaboration with Beolia to produce water. Our water has a serious problem, arsenic and pollution. So we are creating, we have created a small company to bring clean water in the village in a very affordable way. We created a company to produce shoes with Adidas. We challenged them that they should take a position that nobody in the world should go without shoes. And as a shoe company, it is their responsibility to produce shoes affordable to the poorest people. They asked me how much the price should be to make it affordable. I said maybe under one euro. They were shocked that Adidas shoes had to be sold under one euro. 
So I said, well, it's a, if you want to do it, that's the price range you can go. They took the challenge after long debate and discussion within the company. They did that. Now, after two years of research and test marketing, uh, next month we'll have the full mass marketing will begin actually next month. So this is another example of social business because bear, be, wearing Adidas shoes or Reebok shoes doesn't mean you are going for fashion. This is an essential thing. If you go barefoot, particularly in, country, in tropical countries like Bangladesh, you contact lots of diseases, particularly parasitic diseases. And many, many people are affected, particularly women and children are affected by this because they are always in an area where it is very easy to contact uh, parasitic diseases. So you protect them from the parasitic diseases. We have created the Grameen BSF to bring mosquito nets so that you are not attacked by the malaria. And all these companies are done for the sake of protecting yourself from diseases or escape from uh, malnutrition and so on and so forth. Companies don't want to make money out of it. They want to make sure the impact of these companies are on the people. You measure the impact. So in a money-making companies, at the end of the year, you ask your CEO how much money we made this year. The more money you make, more excited you get. In a social business, you, you ask your CEO how much impact we have made this year. You're not asking how much money we made because you're not making money for yourself. If money is made, it stays with the company. But the whole company is dedicated to create the impact. And that's how measurement of impact becomes a very important thing. So that way, if you open it up, this idea can create a new kind of phenomenon. If you, I believe that every human being has that selflessness. But our theory, our concept doesn't allow that to come out. So I'm creating a window, I'm creating a door so that it come out. If it comes out, then all the problems we have created over years and years of our way of single-minded pursuit of uh, money uh, may be addressed by creating all these uh, social business to address that. Technology is our, at our command. We have enormous technology, but this technology is at the con control of the businesses. What do they use of it? Make use of it? Make money. I said, if we can now create a door or create a road to use this technology to solve problems, all this problem will be resolved. Human creativity and human capacity is limitless. In the presence of this limitless human capacity and human creativity, all the problems of the world cannot just stand for a few seconds. It would have to disappear. And this is the age where we all have this capacity of technology. All the question is, do we have the methodology of using this capacity to address these problems? If we do, we can do it through social business. You may have better idea of doing it, but the whole question is creativity of human being has to be channeled to address the problems that we have made for ourselves. If we do that, we can create a whole new world. We can create a whole new civilization. And that's what we should be looking for. Thank you very much.